and we're home. I know it's a small group today, but it's a bigger group out there perhaps, but this is our first Thursday officially back, so why don't you welcome yourselves. We've already welcomed the Holy Spirit, so we started there. <laughs> Cynthia, it's good to have you back again. I got it right. You don't want to welcome somebody and get the wrong name. Isn't that right, Agnes and uh, Wilbur? That's Pastor. This is our former pastor right here. Of course, we're trying to make him more than former, but he'll, he's, he's threatening my life. But that's the McKinney's, and they are a blessing. So if you haven't met them, make sure you meet them today. Hey, guys, I want to ask you, who taught you how to pray? And welcome to our friends that are joining us right now. Who taught you how to pray? Did you learn from Grandma? Was it Grandpa? Did you learn to pray um, in Sunday school? Children's church. I mean, I remember where I learned to pray. My father taught me how to pray. I can remember back at three years of age, because we're using the Hebrew alphabet, there was a prayer for the letter Aleph, then Beit, then Gimel, then Dalid, then hey, then depends on which type of biblical Hebrew you speak, whether you say tav or tau at the end, uh, the last letter. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. We had prayers that went with every single letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's based on Psalm 119, because every, Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, is broken into a stanza of eight verses, all the way through. And I mean, from uh, 20, eight, uh, let's see, let me get it right now, 22 times eight. And every single verse in the first eight verses begins with Aleph. God did this. Then the next eight, every verse begins with the letter Beit. Then Gimel. Then Dalid. Then he it's really a cool thing. And I learned to pray. And there's 22 different categories that we learn based upon that. Then we learn how to pray based on 613 different commands. And, and I look back at this. I'm saying, I thank God someone taught me to pray. But don't worry if you didn't have my dad or my mom because they didn't have Jesus. They desperately needed Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. But you know what? Jesus taught his disciples to pray. How many of you would agree that's as cool as it gets? I mean, wouldn't you love to be able to hang with Jesus right now and he'd say, let me teach you how to pray and what to pray and when to pray. And he, will he tell you to pray without ceasing? But imagine if Jesus, it's available to you right now, by the way, and, and, and the prayer that comes to mind is which prayer? If you, Jesus, the disciples said, Lord, how do we pray? John taught his disciples how to pray. How do we pray? And Jesus taught them which prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Remember, Mark, I think, was it Jeremy or Josiah who thought it was, that God's name was Harold? Because for uh, hallowed be thy name, he thought it was Harold be thy name. You know, but he got a little bit wrong there. But he taught his disciples how to pray. And look at the tragedy. You look at the Catholic Church. You look at the Anglican Church. I'm not putting them down. The Lutheran Church. A lot of times they'll be at a funeral or they'll be at a certain event. Or if you sin and you go to the confessional booth in Catholicism or in Orthodoxy, they'll say, do this amount of Hail Marys and Our Fathers. And, and so you have people that constantly go, Our Father, who art in heaven, help by the name that kingdom come, they will be done on earth. As and it's like no meaning. Someone's like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear, you know? And, and we fail to realize that Jesus did not just teach us to pray in one part of Scripture. He taught us 22 different prayers in Psalm 119, and that's only one aspect of it. We, we can continue and, and, and look at this, and here's what's interesting. Paul also taught us how to pray. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, which we are covering, is, it's the second of two prayers that's record, recorded in Ephesians. The first prayer, if you recall, was in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. In the first prayer, the emphasis was on enlightenment. Enlighten my eyes. Enlighten my mind. Lord, I don't want to keep making the same mistakes. I want to access everything I have in you since I'm seated with Christ, the theme of Ephesians, in heavenly places. It was, I need enlightenment. Do we really know what's available to us in Jesus? A lot of times, friends, we come together and we create a religion, which means returning to bondage in Latin, instead of a relationship with Jesus, because if the truth were really known, we don't realize 
What does it mean to be seated with Christ? Do you have a question? You're seated with Christ when you're a believer in heavenly places. One commentator put it this way, if these are heavenly places, why do I feel like I'm in hell? And there's some things I'm going to answer tonight. In the second prayer, we go from enlightenment, you can review this, you can go on Facebook Live, free of charge, to enablement. Enablement. You see, friends, many of us are enablers in our marriage. We're enablers with our children. We're enablers at work. We're enablers with alcoholic friends, and the list goes on. This is not the kind of enablement we're talking about. You see, God doesn't just envision us. He doesn't just enlighten us, but he enables us because he equips us. In fact, the Bible says he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. And it talks about the pastors, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers. You know what I'm talking about. And he says these are gifts he's given us, but why did he give us pastors? Why did he give us teachers? For the perfecting, the maturation, the maturing of the saints that they might do the work of the ministry. That they might do here you've got Kenny who's a part of this church since nine years of age and now he's with the youth and there's things that we're teaching him to do right now and he's being equipped. One of our kids here, you've got Laura born in this church and now she's being raised up to be involved. You've got Chris, he's been in this church how many years about guys? Approximately how many years? Seven years? So and how old are you now, Chris? Twenty. So since he's been bar mitzvahed, right, 13 years of age. Jared, you've been in this church your whole life. Your whole life. From fetus to mighty man of God. And here he is, ministering. This is what it's all about. You see, God doesn't just want to enlighten us. He wants to enable us. He wants to equip us. Why? To do the work of the ministry. Did you know there's always an antichrist to a Christ? There's always another gospel to the gospel. There's another Jesus to a Jesus. There's another spirit to the spirit of God. In the same way, many of us, we're looking for enlightenment in things that are not of God. This is what Eastern religion's all about. This is what Mormonism's about. Many of us are looking for enlightenment. This is where intellectualism can come in. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be an intellect. And then we enable people to sin. We enable people with excuses. We enable people to continue to rebel against God. We enable people to even gossip and cause division. But when we do it God's way, he says, no, 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 I'm going to enlighten you. The word is a lamp. That's enlightenment in the Hebrew. It's a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. It's God who says, I'm equipping you for a better life. I don't just want you to operate in the two-dimensional, those of you watching right now, or the three-dimensional where we just do it in our own human strength and ability, but he wants to bring us to the fourth dimension. He wants to bring us into a spiritual insight, but you can't do it without the Word. You can't do it without the core values we have here. How many of you agree you can't do it without Jesus, core value one? Two, you can't do it without the Bible, core, the Word, core value number two. You can't do it without prayer. You can't do it without worship. That's our first four core values as a church. We're very, very clear about this. You can't do this without relationships. That's what communion is about. A relationship with God and a relationship with one another. You can't do it without serving. If you want to become great in God's kingdom, you have to serve. The Son of Man modeled what it is to be equipped and enabled. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve. And then number seven, Jesus didn't call us to make decisions. He called us to make disciples. He said, make disciples of all nations. And then he tells us how to do it. You see, friends, in the second prayer, the emphasis is on enablement. It's not so much a matter of knowing as it is being. In him I live and move and have my being. If the truth were known, we've come to know a lot in the body of Christ. There's been a lot of teaching, friends. I do verse-by-verse verse teaching on Sunday morning. On, on, I'm sorry, on Thursday night. On Sunday evening, I go back and forth. And how many of you know Sunday morning? I'm topical with a lot of verses of Scripture. And I have a series starting in a few weeks 
Based on Romans 12, it'll be verse by verse by verse, followed by 2 Peter. We're going to be doing a teaching out of that book, again, verse by verse. But there's many different ways we can approach this. But how many of you know that the real issue is not teaching more, though I still want to teach? It's not knowing more, because the Bible says, to much is given, much is required. It says we will be held accountable for what we know, because to him who knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? Very good. That's right, Ron. Sin. So the key is to get people to now start acting on what they know, acting on what they've seen. This is what the book of Acts, they acted, is all about. As Theophilus, you, there's, there's a letter written to Theophilus. And some believe it's Dr. Luke, I do, who wrote the book. But, and yet there's another person that was involved in writing it along with him. That's a whole other teaching. And he says, that which we have seen, that which we've experienced, if you read it in the Greek, that which we have touched with our own hands, we have these not just proofs, which would be good enough, but they're infallible proofs, which means they're proof proofs. They're that good. And so in the second prayer, it's not so much just being enabled. It's not just a matter of knowing, gnosis, knowledge, because you can worship knowledge, but it's also being. This prayer we're going to go over encourages us to grab hold of what God has for us, and we grab hold of it by faith. Have you really grabbed hold of what God has for you by faith? I'm talking about healing. Yeah, I am. And by the way, I want to be really clear. A person once said that a person should be healed every single time we pray. I'm going to be really clear. You will not find that in the Scripture. But I will tell you, every time you're healed, it is God. I want you to know the Lord can use physicians as well. Marge, have we not seen many, 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 many healings and miracles? You'd be an example of that. So we're not saying that doesn't happen. But we have to look to what the Word says here. Are we really, this is what Ephesians is all about. Are we doing what Paul did? Grabbing hold of what God has for us by faith. Now, a lot of us think, but if I grab hold of what God has for me by faith, my life's going to just be a bowl of cherries. It might be a bowl of cherry pits, guys, because what's Paul doing? He's telling us about this glorious life he has. He's telling about what it means to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. He's talking about what it is to be God's workmanship. He's talking about what it is to be created in Christ Jesus. He teaches us what it is to be in Christ. And he does this against the backdrop of an evil emperor by the name of Nero, married to three consecutive women and then two consecutive men. And here's a guy killing Christians, feeding them to the lions, crucifying them, and then putting them in his urns in his garden and turning them into human candles. And yet Paul's talking about this incredible life that we have. Paul wants to see us take hold of what God has for us and make it a vital part of our lives. Hear me out as we go through Ephesians now, as we really delve into the second half of the third chapter, what are you really living your life by? Man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But what are we really living our life by? I'm just wondering, friends. You see, he's saying that often we live our life by human philosophies and ideologies, social constructs, the opinions of others, the misinterpretation of others. And he's saying, no, 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 no. We have to live our life by the uncompromising, unadulterated, guaranteed. It's a slam dunk word of God. Now, it's important to note that both of these prayers deal with, one, the spiritual condition of the inner man, not the material needs of our body. There's places we see, Luke chapter, I mean, Matthew chapter 6, you see the material needs as well. Joshua 1, eight. I can show you some prosperity. I can show you some success. But how many of you agree with me that we must make sure that when we apply the Word of God, we better rightly correctly divide the word of truth. So it deals with the spiritual condition of the inner man, not the material needs of the body. This is the, also the focus of the other prison prayers. Paul teaches us how to pray from his prison cell experience. Can you imagine that? What would you be praying in prison? Would you be worshiping in prison? Imagine the prison doors open up when you do this, and God sets an earthquake. 
but what would you be doing? Why me? Why is this my life? I don't get this. But in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, and Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 12, we see these prison prayers where the Lord is teaching us how to pray, and it deals with our spiritual condition in prison. I have a question. Corey Ten Boone puts it this way. How many of you ever heard the name Corey Ten Boone? Corey Ten Boone. I had a chance to meet her. I, I, I used to say when she was alive, obviously when she was alive, I didn't conjure her back from the dead or anything. And she said something I'll never forget. She says, the benchmark of authenticity of who you really are is when God doesn't operate in your life according to your goodwill and your good pleasure. Who are you? Who am I when things don't go my way? Can I still say the joy of the Lord is my strength, okay? What is the focus of your prayer life? That's what Ephesians is asking us. What is? I mean, just stop for a moment. Friends, one good thing about me coming to Hemet, <laughs> this place has brought me to my knees. This place has brought me to my knees. But Tacoma brought me to my knees too. Oh, oh, come to think of it, March Chicago. Remember when we were, I wasn't looking to be a senior pastor. I love being a youth pastor. I love being a children's pastor. I love the things that we did with the drama ministry. Do you remember how it brought us to our knees when all of a sudden Mike Sianowski, he looked like Sylvester Stallone, Rocky. He talked like Rocky. I just got through doing a week of meetings, and this was Halloween. Talk about a haunted house, a nightmare. I'm sitting there with him in his place in Breckenridge, Minnesota. And he looked at me, and he said, Wolfson, i got a question i got to ask you. Absolutely. You're doing real well there at Home with Full Gospel Church, and they're paying you pretty well. Absolutely. And I know you're Jewish. Okay. And he said, are you still, I mean, you're 31 years old. Are you still doing the youth pastor and the associate pastor thing because it's convenient and, and, and because that's what you want to do? Because I think you're supposed to be a senior pastor, and our fellowship's desperate for senior pastors. Or are, are you doing this because that's really God's will? And he says, I just really believe you're supposed to pastor a church. And so we had a... <laughs> <laughs> we used in our fellowship that we're a part of, we had a uh, magazine called Fellowship Today. Before that, it was called Conviction Magazine. And then we said when we changed the name to Fellowship Today, we lost our convictions. But anyway, and we looked, and there was a church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where a friend of mine, Pastor Lloyd Jacobson, uh, was about to retire, not retire, was about to leave, and they were looking for a pastor, and the name of the church was Bethel, House of God. Then there was another church in San Francisco. Marge, you were not gung-ho on going to San Francisco back then, but you said whatever God's will is. And the name of the church was, you'll never guess, Bethel. Then there was an Assemblies of God church that called me in Oak, Park, Illinois, on Austin Avenue, saying, we believe you're supposed to be our next pastor, and the name of the church was Bethel. Then there was a church in Tacoma, Washington, Bethel Christian Assembly. At this point, I didn't know where God was calling me, but I had a real sneaking suspicion the name of the church might be Bethel, or House of God. But you see, what is the focus of your prayer life? I didn't want to miss God. I wasn't looking for my ego to be stroked and to be a lead pastor. We had a major team. Things were going well. But you see, it is, is it your inner man? Is it an, when you pray, is it inner man? The Bible talks about being built up in your most holy faith, being built up in the Holy Spirit. Do you really ask the Lord, your inner man, Lord, I want to circumcise my heart. When you pray, God, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Or is the focus of your prayer the outer man? My name's Jimmy, I want all you can give me. And I'm not saying it's wrong to want nice things. How many of you like nice things? How many of you like a car that doesn't break down every day? How many of you like to have a home where, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't have termites? And, the, and how many of you think air conditioning is a blessing out here? Especially in a place like that. I'm not suggesting it's wrong to pray for physical and material needs. But did you know, Pastor McKinney, 
Nowhere in Scripture was that supposed to be the focus. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and being in right standing with him is righteousness. And then all these outer man things, all these things will be added unto you. Please don't misunderstand. I like nice things. I like my checks not to boom, boom, bounce when I write them, when they're deposited in the bank, okay? Paul knew that if the inner man was healthy, that the outer man would be taken care of in God's timing as well. So I want you to just take a moment right now, whatever you're going through, and I think it's great to pray for healing. I think it's great to pray for God to do something in your life. But are your prayers, this is what Ephesians is all about. Come to think of it, it's what James is all about. Come to think of it, this is, well, I can keep on going. Deuteronomy 28 is all about. You ever notice, man, it's like you could choose blessings or cursings. The Bible makes it real clear you can choose life or death. But the whole concept of Deuteronomy 28, when you were a person of the covenant, was if your prayers were inner man based, the outer man took care of itself. What does the Lord say in Joshua 1 8? If you meditate on the word day and night, whoa, that's inner man. Do all that's written therein, that's inner man. God will cause you to have great success, He'll make your ways prosperous. See, many of our prayers today often focus on the physical, the material needs. And I want you to really hear what I'm about to show you, because it's right from the book of Ephesians. Our prayers often fail to address the deeper needs of the heart. Well, it's kind of like marriage. Come on, sweetheart. Come on, my friend. When you got married, it was to meet a physical need, whether it was sexual or whether it was security. It was to know that somebody would be there for me on my deathbed. It was to know I'm in this relationship. But what would happen if we could teach our kids? What if we really addressed our marriage from an inner man need, not an outer man need? That's the principle. How many of you would agree that in America and even in our world today that marriage has not been the blessed covenant that many people go into marriage hoping it would be. The principle is if we have outer man need prayers and that is the focus of our prayers, the inner man is going to be in a famine, in a drought. And it's important. It would do us good to study these prison prayers and allow them to strengthen our inner man in prayer. You know what I've learned when you lift weights, when you lift, when you do cardiovascular work, it strengthens your body. Well, what's your workout regimen for your inner man? Well, you're just really beating me up today. No, I'm not. How many of you believe that uh, the Scripture is very clear? God says, I would that you prosper. You know what that means? I would that you grow and flourish and develop even as your soul prospers. Are, are we nourishing our soul? Are we feeding our soul? Are we building our inner man? Any prayer that is not based on the word is questionable at best. What are your, what are your prayers based on? Are they impulsive? Are they impetuous? Are they in the moment? I'm just hurting right now. God, take this away. When you're praying for God to strengthen your inner man, God, what are you showing me? What are you trying to do in my life? What are you working out in my life right now? What would happen if we would pray, Lord, there's something you're showing me. There's something you're doing in my life. I'm seated with you. This hasn't caught you by surprise. In heavenly places, I'm seated in Christ. So God, what is it I have to learn? What is it I have to know? Our greatest needs are in the realm of our inner man. The Bible says the battle is in the soul. Why do we put on the whole armor of God? I'm not going to teach you on that tonight. What would happen if we really had the breastplate of righteousness? Because the heart above all us is deceitfully wicked. Who could know it? The Bible tells us that we are to guard our hearts because out of our heart proceeds the issues of life. The Scripture makes it crystal clear that our heart can deceive us. 
how would your life and how would my life change if I said, I want to make sure my inner man, maybe I don't get a facelift, but my heart gets lifted up. Maybe I'm not going to be able to take care of those sagging eyelids, or maybe I'm not going to be able to take care of all these other things that bother me. Maybe I'm not going to get Botox where I can put on a happy face. Actually, with Botox, sometimes you can't put on a happy face because you kind of get frozen there. Not breaking anyone down, but I want to show you right now that the majority of our prayers, oh God, please do something for my grandchild, please do something for my wife, Lord, and so often just physical, so often just healing. How many of you know I believe in healing? Actually, I believe in the healer. He is our healer, Yahweh Rafecha, the God who heals us. But I want to show you this inner man prayer. That's why I've given you such a long introduction today. Here it is. We call this the invocation. This is not a high school graduation. This is a different invocation. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. This is where revival comes from. If we could get our inner man strengthened today, if we can get it developed today, if we can get our inner man healed today, if we can get our inner man in sync with the spirit of the living God, I promise you we're going to start seeing miracles in the outer man as well. Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 15. Listen to Paul. For this reason, I want to know what the reason is, I kneel before the Lord. For this reason, what is it that brought Paul to his knees? It wasn't religiosity. I kneel before the Lord. From whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Anyone who's ever going to be born again. Anyone whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he says, everyone, we derive our name when you become a Christian. When you become a child of the covenant, you derive your name from, from, from who? The Father. We have received the spirit of adoption by which we, we cry, Abba, Papa. He says, for this reason, I'm kneeling. Now we can see the elders in Revelation. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And for thy pleasure, I was created. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. What is it that brings me to my knees? And it's before the Father. The whole family in heaven, Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Sarah, oh, Ruth, Ruth, Rebecca, Rachel, all of them derive their name, their standing, their position from the Father who's in heaven. Now do you see why we pray our Father who art in heaven? <laughs> Hallowed be thy name. Why are we lifting up his name? Why are we worshiping his name? This is where we derive our name from. God wants to strengthen your inner man. Now look at this. The first thing that strikes us about Paul's prayer is his posture. I bow my knees. Man, do you know when Paul wrote this, this is a prison prayer. The dude's in prison. Do, do you see this? This is one of the prison epistles. He, he, he's telling us something I don't want you to miss today. This, if it's a prison epistle... What does that mean? There was a Roman soldier right next to Paul when he wrote this. Did you know that? There was a Roman soldier. Oh, and Paul was chained. Remember Paul, a prisoner in bonds. Okay? He said, here's a Roman, emperor, a, 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 here's a, a Roman soldier that Paul is tethered to. And how do you think this impacted him? Here's Paul. Right there, the guy sees him saying, for this reason. Come on, dude, you got to kneel with me. <laughs> I didn't ask to be chained to you, but I don't mind. 
We are told historically that Paul led so many people he was tethered to to Jesus, they had to keep taking these soldiers and get rid of them and then get another one and a harsher one, a harder one, because they kept getting saved. Can you imagine that? This is evangelism, man. This is a great ministry. And he kept leading them to Christ. What does this do when Paul's not saying, I don't deserve this. I do everything right. This isn't fair. Why me, God? He said, look, for this reason, I'm kneeling before the Father right now. Let me tell you where I get my name. Let me tell you who I belong to. I bow my knees. Nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to employ or adopt any specific posture when we pray. But you have to see this today. Terry, Patty, you're going to love this. If you don't love it, I'll love it for all of us. How's that? I mean, it's really that important. Abraham stood before the Lord. For those of you that like to have devotions or study, I'm going to give you some scriptures. Abraham stood before the Lord when he prayed for Sodom. He stood. Lord, if there be 50, will you spare them? 40, 30, 20, 10. Genesis 18, 22. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived up until this point on earth, stood when he prayed to dedicate the temple. 1 Kings chapter 8.22. You know what David did as king? He sat before the Lord when he prayed about the future of his kingdom. Uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, that was, uh, by the way, 1 Chronicles 17.16. Jesus fell on his face. This is Jesus modeling this for us when he prayed in Gethsemane in Matthew 26, verse 39. He so stood for us here. He so strengthened his inner man that the Bible says he sweat drops of blood. How many of you think he had heaven on his mind for you, for me, that we might be sons and daughters of God? The emphasis in Ephesians is on spiritual posture, not physical posture, if you will. As lost sinners, we burned in the graveyard, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, we're dead. We see this in Galatians 2.20 as well. We are burning in the graveyard. When we trusted Christ, it says, he raised us from the dead. And he seated us with himself, with Christ Jesus, in the what? Heavenlies. Everything changed. Now, because we're seated with Christ, we can walk so as to please him. Guys, write this down for when you get home. Ephesians 4.1, Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 12, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, and 8, and verse 15. I mean, verse after verse after verse. We see we're seated with Christ, heavenly places, that we might be strengthened in our inner man. And here's the key. When your inner man or woman's been strengthened, people will take note you've been with the master. I, I, I made a, um, Bobby, I, I made a comment about you, and somebody else agreed with this a couple weeks ago. Uh, Bobby was up here just leading worship. And how many of you ever noticed when she leads worship, she's not really all that worried about what you're doing? She's just worshiping. And I said, and somebody said, what makes her worship different? And I said, people take note she's been with Jesus. With the early disciples, people took note that they had been with Jesus. At times, friends, we just look at somebody who's leading worship. Oh, it just touched me, and I felt so good. And we enjoy the style and the quality and the ability, and it's all there. That's not the question. But we have to ask ourselves this question today. Since we're seated with Christ... Should we not be able to please him? And what happens when you're pleasing him? What happens when people can take note there's something different about you? Now, here it is. So there's something they teach us in Hebrew. I want you to really get this. Our position also allows us to stand against the devil. Even Job. You want to talk about going through hell in order to get to heaven. 
Job literally was able to stand against the devil. Paul puts it this way. After you've done everything to stand, this is against the devil. What does he say to do? Stand. <laughs> Continue to stand. You see, friends, here it is. That's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. So if you want to look at the putting on the armor of God. Now, here it is. Here it is. There's a posture that links us. Here's what you learn in Hebrew. There's a posture that links sitting, walking, and standing. Three of the postures of prayer. Sitting, walking, and standing. And it comes from the word baruch, to kneel. To kneel. You see, the Jewish sage is taught, and you see this in Scripture, and the rabbis later on talk about it, that you know what, friends, whether you're sitting, whether you're walking, whether you're standing, there's something that brings it all together when your knees hit the pavement, when your knees hit the carpet. It's a sign of worship. It's a sign of humility, the bowing of the knee. It is through prayer, Paul is teaching us, that we lay hold of God's riches. It's not the confession, ah, I, I claim a Mercedes in the name of Jesus. I just claim this certain net worth, and I do believe God wants you to prosper. I'm not suggesting he doesn't. Otherwise, how do we further the kingdom? But there's something in prayer when it says we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, it shows we therefore can then lay hold of his riches. It is his empowerment of riches. Because how many of you are open to God's riches? How many of you say today, give it to me, Lord. I'm there. Count me in. Don't tell me riches don't matter. But let me show you what the riches are supposed to do for us as we read this in Ephesians. Uh, number one, if, you've real, if you're really seated with Christ in heavenly places, Jesus said, I only do what I've seen my Father do. Jesus also teaches us, now you need to do what you see me doing. I love this, man. It's this empowerment of riches that enables us to do these things. Write them down. Behave like Christians. When you're seated with Christ, and if you really believe Christ can see you, and if you really believe your meat is to do his will, one of the first things that happens that's an earmark and an indicator you're seated with Christ is you begin to behave like a Christian. And that's why whenever I'm not behaving like a Christian, I said, did I get up out of turn? Did I walk away from Jesus? Did I just go and do my own thing over here? When you're really seated with Christ, how many of you agree you begin to behave like a Christian? Not out of religion. Number two, you begin to battle like a Christian. Jesus taught us spiritual warfare. Jesus told us what we are to do and what we are to rebuke and what we are to literally speak forth. How many of you think there's, how many of you think generational curses are real? How many of you believe we inherit generational curses? I believe that. Guess what? Friends, when you really are seated with Christ and you have grabbed hold of his riches, we learn this in Ephesians, you'll begin to battle like a Christian. So you behave like a Christian, you battle like a Christian. And you become like a Christian. It's not fabricated. It's not something you do because I've given you three cute little points on how to do it. Whether we bow our knees is not the important thing. Here's what we learn in the book of Ephesians. It's bowing our heart and our will to the Lord. That's the issue here. You see, friends, you learn in Judaism. That's the Old Testament. And you learn in the new covenant, when I bow my knee, oh, we bow down, we lay it down at the feet of Jesus. When we bow it down, guess what? And this is key. There's a sign. I'm here to do your will, Lord. Praying his will for our inner man is the focus of this prayer that I just read. And here's our problem. Today, how many people really have bowed their knee, bowed their will, bowed their heart to Jesus? I love it. Paul's prayer was addressed to who? No, you got to get this now. This is really important. Abba. Paul's Focus, his prayer was addressed to the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Do you ever wonder why he said that? 
It's more than a salutation. It's more than a greeting. It's more than some religious rhetoric. He's saying, no, I'm speaking right now. My, the whole focus of my prayer, you've got to see this now, to the Father of our Lord Jesus. Did you know when we pray, the Bible says, and praying, we're to say, Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Well, why is that important? It's vital. It doesn't matter. You can say, well, but my heart is, no, no, wait, wait, wait. The re you see, we were separated in the Garden of Eden from the Father. True or false? We were separated. Je there's one mediator between man and God, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that reconciles us to the Father. And Jesus says, but I've got to leave. It's my blood that enables you to be reconciled to the Father, but it's the Holy Spirit working in you. It is the Holy Spirit that enables you to be able to come to the Father, but the blood of Jesus has not literally cleansed you from all unrighteousness then the Father must turn his face, his back on you. Now watch this now. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Ephesians 1.3 calls the Father, I want you to see it again, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that tell you? In Ephesians, we're introduced to a very unique thought. We're being introduced that, wait, the Father is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus was here on earth. Well, why did he do that? Well, what's the reason behind that? There's a principle that we have to see. Friends, many of us have father issues. Maybe you had an earthly father that didn't, uh, shall I say, model for you Yahweh, Elohim, our heavenly father. And it's saying, I want you to see something. Jesus had the perfect father. As he was in this world, so are we. And no matter what your earthly father was, when you're in relationship with Jesus, when you bow your knee down before Jesus, he's reconciling you to the father. And what did Adam and Eve do? They spoke with God, the father, every day in the cool of the evening. See, when Jesus was here on earth as a man, he lived in total dependence upon his God, upon his Father. Now, you've got to hear this today. Do you live your life in total dependence? Not independence, not interdependence, and not intradependence, but in total dependence on the Father. Now, you can say this isn't important. I'm saying this is what Ephesians is all about. This is what the epistles were all about. When Jesus was on earth, he says, listen, I can't do anything unless the Father tells me to do it. I only do what I've seen of the Father. I only do what I've heard of the Father. This is key. And what does this do? It's reminding us of Jesus' humanity. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus was 50% God or 50% man? 100% God, 100% man. Do you think Jesus really needed to live in total dependence on the Father? Well, in heaven, no. They were one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. I'm starting a series here on uh, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And, and what you're going to find, and it's fascinating, is Jesus, they were already one. But on earth... He's saying, total dependence. I'm modeling this for you, for me. Now, 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 the, this, this title of God the Father in relationship to Jesus, it reminds us of Christ's humanity. Now, the term Father of our Lord Jesus Christ refers to the deity of Jesus Christ. You'll see this in a second. I know it's a little bit deep, but it's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is eternal, and here we see his relationship in, con in, 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 in relationship to the Godhead. This focus is not on the earthly dependence to the Father as God. See, friends, there's a sense where all men, every person, and all Christians in particular, share in the fatherhood of God. But would it be possible, just help me out here, 
that in your relationship, when you got saved, maybe you went to a Billy Graham crusade. Nothing against Billy Graham, like him. We keep telling people, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Accept Jesus, and that's true. And you need to do it. But where does the Father fit in? Where's your relationship out with the Father? Notice the enemy's done everything he can to try to disenfranchise us from our earthly relationship with our earthly fathers. How many of you agree we've got an orphan spirit in our nation today? Friends, we've taken the father out of the whole picture in many situations, and often it's the mother who's the spiritual force in the home. This is really important. You see this. But Jesus, we don't know what Joseph was really like. He seemed like a good guy. And Jesus had a relationship with his father. I mean, oh, he became a carpenter. His dad was a carpenter. But here's what I want you to consider for just a moment. We already know that all men in general, and Christians in particular, we share in the fatherhood of God. This is not universalism. There's only one name by which a man must be saved. But I'm going to argue that many of us have a disconnected relationship from the Godhead. We have this relationship, Jesus, there's something about that name, and that's good. I love you, Jesus. You should. Jesus, you've cleansed me from my sins. Yes, but why? So you could be reconciled to the Father. Why am I hitting this so hard? Paul states the whole family in heaven and on earth, the whole family in heaven and on earth, oh, I'm going to bring this home in a second, is named after the divine Father. He says where our name comes from. He says where we've derived our name. And yet, friends, can I tell you why a lot of people feel that it's not fair and nobody notices me and nobody does anything for me and all I have is this orphan spirit, all I have is a lack? It's because you got saved and now you've been standing there as, as, as disconnected from the rest of the Godhead. You don't have the Holy Spirit operating in you on an ongoing basis. Oh, he's there. You got saved. You received the Holy Spirit instantly as a deposit. It sealed the fact that you are saved, but you've not cashed in on what it means to be saved yet. That's on the other side of eternity. And instantly, you're supposed to have this intimate relationship. We've received the spirit of adoption by which you cry, Abba, Papa. See, Paul states the whole family, I'm going to show you something here, in heaven and earth is named after the divine Father. The word family that's used here, this might shock you, can also be translated fatherhood. You came into a family and you received the Father's name. You became a part of of Father God. That's where you received your divine name. Now, you might say, oh, this doesn't matter. It really does. I thought the gospel's simple. Salvation really is. The word of God is far from <laughs> simple, if you will. Now, every fatherhood in heaven, look at this now, and on earth gets its origin and name from the Father. That's where we even use the name in Hebrew, Hashem, the name. It's the name of Jesus, yes, but Hashem in the Old Covenant, friends, it was about, I want to be related to the Father. I want to be connected to the Father. Now, that's why, what was Adam called in the Old Covenant? Did you know he is called the Son of God in reference to his creation? Did you know that believers are the sons of God by rebirth. Adam was recognized as a son of God. Did that make him God? Of course not. He's a 100% human being. But when you and I got saved, we were reconnected to this family, fatherhood of God, as a result of being born again. But notice this. I want you to see this now. All men are not children of God by nature. How many of you knew that? How many of you ever hear this one? Oh, we're all the children of God. That's not true. I can prove it. You see, friends, the Bible actually says they're children of disobedience and children of wrath. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 through 3. 
in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit. This is why we're going to learn about spiritual warfare, friends. <laughs> you got to see this now. We talked about that yesterday, Bill, didn't we, in our deacon meeting. You're so right on this one. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. This whole concept, oh, we're all the children of God. We're all part of the family of God is bunk. It's not true. This is universalism. Then it leads to a place that says, well, because we're all the children of God, we're all saved, even if we don't accept Jesus. Then it says in verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature objects of wrath. That means we were going to hell. Objects of wrath. Do you remember on the cross the Bible says every one of us were objects of wrath, but what does Peter teach us? And what does Paul teach us? And the Father poured out his wrath. That's because we're no longer sons. We're no longer part of the family of God. We're out of sync. And he's pouring his wrath out. And Bill Wolfson saying, I'm freaking out. No, no. This is where Jonathan Edwards' sermon comes. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, which that's not exactly how God might have communicated, not scripturally. Because the Bible goes on to say, when I received the spirit of adoption by which I cry, Abba, Father, and the wrath of God's being poured out, Jesus says, wait a minute. And it says the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. He took the wrath. But many of us have to say, why do I still the same cravings and I'm gratifying my sinful nature and why is it the same devil who's at work and the children of disobedience why are we seeing the exact same sins in the church that we're seeing in the world at the same percentages well there's a reason there's a major reason that we have to look at in Romans 1 it told us all the sins of the world and the church is going yeah you sinners, oh, I thank God I'm not like those people. I'm going to vote for this guy to be president or that guy to be president, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to come out against these guys. I want the world to know everything I'm against. And he says, no, 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 no. But therefore, by the way, church, you're inexcusable when you judge another. Because when you condemn another, you are being judged for the exact same sins. In other words, what he's saying, and this is back at the time of Romans, he said, church, you get it. There are many of us in the church. We have the same desires, the same lusts, the same cravings, and we've never been seated with Christ in heavenly places because we've never crucified the old man. We never accepted what Jesus Christ did. And he's saying once you do that, it all changes. He as creator, God is the father of each man. That's true. He created you to be his child. We were all created. Adam and Eve became the children of God without even asking. It was a guarantee. All of us, then the wrath of God poured out on Adam and Eve. We all inherit that automatically. The day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will what? Surely die. But watch this. I know there's a little bit out there. But really, it's biblical. Elder Ellen, this is very biblical. But notice what he says. When you, when Jesus Christ died for our sins, we have to come into covenantal agreement with what Jesus said. And many of us don't. And that's the key. You see, as creator, God is the father of each man. As savior, he is only father of those who believe. As Lord, he's only father to those who believe. Let me finish up. There's no such thing as the universal nature of God that saves all men. How I many of you know, friends, that's Madonna's got into Kabbalism. She's got into kind of a Jewish type thing, but she doesn't live it at all. And you've got so many of our Hollywood stars today. 
If you listen to what they're teaching, this is where Carlton um, Pearson got in trouble. And he had a mega church going on in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And then all of a sudden he decided, if God's a good God, if God's a faithful God, if God's a loving God, then let me help you out. He's, he died for all of our sins, and he's not letting anybody go to hell. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you said you want to do a verse by verse. <laughs> There's no such thing as the universal nature of God that saves all men. Have to be born again. So here's what Paul's teaching us. The doctrine of inclusion is a false doctrine. And you may not want to believe me right now, but friends, a lot of us, our kids will be out fornicating, but they prayed the sinner's prayer when they were younger. A lot of times our kids are out doing all their edibles and all their drugs and all their stuff out there. Oh, I know they're saved and God's a good God. And I understand the emotion when, when your kids die or something happens and God's saying, do you get this? There's no such thing as cheap grace. Unbelievers love to play the father card when it comes to God. How many of you, ever, how many of you know people that tell you, oh, I'm a spiritual person? Satan is too. I'm a spiritual person. God's doing great things in my life. But they have no biblical or logical basis for their assertion. If this has been a little bit difficult, a little bit deep, can I, I'm going to make a recommendation. I remember when I first went to ministry, we charged money for all, all my teachings. It's on Facebook for free. It's on YouTube for free. It's on Venmo for free. It's on our website for free. Did you get that? Word there, free. Guys, this is just doctrine 101. And I'm here, how many of you believe what I'm preaching here might be true? I promise you it is. And why are we in trouble today? Because we're going to churches where God loves everybody. Well, wait a minute. He loved Jacob. He hated Esau. Can I tell you what that means in Hebrew? He hated Esau. God's not a respecter of persons. That doesn't mean God's fair. That's just not true at all. He's just, but he's not fair. What it's telling us is something a little bit different. God is not a respecter of persons. means Bill Wolfson as a Jew and Marge as a Gentile, we get saved the same way. There's not this different kind of salvation that's going to happen. But I'm going to show you next time, and it's big. It's called the Great Petition. It's in Ephesians 3, verse 16 through 19. And you're going to see there's four requests that God, through Paul, is going to teach us we can make. But here's what I'd like to ask you today. Please don't miss this. Do you really believe in your heart of hearts that God is your father? Raise your hand today if you had an imperfect father. If anyone had a perfect father, wow. Wow doesn't exist. Is it possible just for a moment that you can just reflect on this thought? Do you know anybody who has an orphan spirit? They always feel they're being cheated, mistreated, done wrong. They write songs like, hey, won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song? They always feel they're not getting their fair portion. They feel that their life's not going the right way. Paul is talking to people that are being crucified in the streets of Ephesus. I've been there. I've been right down the street. I've been to the great, Col uh, not Colosseum, this is the circus where they were being thrown to the lions. And he says, when you know who your father is, when you really know who your father is, when you really get it, he says, when you come to a place that you know you're seated with Christ in heavenly places and you know you've received the spirit of adoption and you realize it's not universalism and just because somebody's a nice person and a fun person and maybe in your mind a good person, it has nothing to do with having an inheritance in Christ, a stake in the kingdom. In fact, it doesn't mean that the first 11 chapters of Roman have happened for them, that they are in Christ Jesus. So... This is just kind of the beginning of chapter 3. How many of you will agree with me there might be some more and that the best is yet to come? Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I pray right now for each and every one of us, we will know where we derive our name. We will realize, Lord God, we are the children of God, the sons of God, according to your word, 
called by your name. Lord, I thank you that we choose not to be children of disobedience and children of wrath. We thank you, Lord God, that because we're your sons, because we're in relationship with you, because we're the bride of Christ, that when the wrath is being spilled out on us, you go, wait, 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 wait. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> and so we have been exempt from that. That's why we can say what I love to preach. Oh, what manner of love the Father's bestowed upon us that we might be called the sons of God. I thank you Jesus modeled this whole thing for us when he says, the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the first fruit of God, raised from the dead. And what you did for Jesus, he modeled it for us. You're saying, I want to do this for you as well. Lord, as we receive the empowerment of riches, of riches that enables us to behave like Christians, battle like Christians, become like Christians, not in our flesh, not in our strength, not by might, not by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord of hosts. So for this reason, I conclude, Lord, we kneel before you, the Father. We kneel before you. Help us to receive our inheritance by where, and here's the liberty wherein Christ has set us free in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Love you guys. This is what Thursday, how many of you are glad on Thursday night we go a little bit deeper? We get into this word. This is vital, friends. Tell your friends to check this out because I'm going to argue the majority of people worldwide that have accepted Jesus Christ there's so much that's been left to them. That's why the Old Testament and the New Testament, the last will and last testament of God, it's yours. There's so much God has for you that we're leaving on the table. And this community can't afford for us not to grab hold of it because this is going to be key for the revival about to come. God bless you.